Okay, um, hi, I'm Dr. Bracha Lowinger. I'm the um, mental health coordinator for Achiezer. My role here really is just um, as an introduction to the session. Um, that's going to, you're going to hear from three people, um, different perspectives. Sure. You'll hear um, from three people, uh, different perspectives on this topic. Uh, first from Rabbi Flaum, um, who's a spiritual dean at Lander College for Women, um, the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Sharet Zion, and he's also a worldwide expert on medical ethics. Um, <laughs> you will be hearing from Dr. Martin Grossman, who's been in private practice for 18 years, and um, <clears throat> he has served as a hospice medical director at MJHS Hospice Inpatient Unit, and we'll be talking also about um, medical issues, medical um, choices for people um, who are terminally ill. And also from Alexander Balko, who's the executive vice president and chief operating officer of Metropolitan Jewish Health System. And um, I'm going to be passing out some index cards. You have pens in your bags. And whatever questions come up for you as the people are speaking, you can write them down on these cards. We'll pass them up towards the end, you know, towards the end of the session, and um, your questions can then be addressed in that way. Okay, so I'm going to leave it to Rabbi Flaum. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting us to come to participate in the conference over here. Um, we have three different individuals who are going to speak about the question of treating terminal Ill patients and hospice care, and each of us have a specific specialty. I want to just set the record straight about the halachic requirements of treating terminal Ill patients who are holding at the end of life. Uh, after I finish my presentation, quite obviously the doctor will then discuss quite obviously the medical phenomenon, and I'm sure the institutional representative will discuss the institutional requirements. I first want to set the record straight this afternoon and make sure things are clear in your mind because unfortunately in the marketplace today there's tremendous confusion about certain piske halachos that are circulating in the marketplace and if you hear what I have to say in the next couple of minutes you understand what I mean. Normally according to Torah law there's a halacha requirement when a person is sick. I don't care what sickness it is. There's a mitzvah in the Torah based upon rapi rapi for the person to seek out medical help and for the medical community to deal with their medical needs and necessities. There are a whole bunch of mitzvahs asays, mitzvahs los asays involved with this. But there's no question that a person who is deathly ill has to search out doctors to heal them. There's a chiva on the patient, there's a chiva upon the medical community to deal with them, to treat them as best as they possibly can. Now this halacha, which is mentioned in the Shulchan Aruch when it comes to mitzvah refuah, applies under normal circumstances basically during the entire existence of the illness and uh, if there is a hope and prayer that this person can be cured there's no question that you have the uh, halachic obligation based upon the mitzvah asa and losa say to do what you can to try to heal this person based upon the ability of the medical knowledge and the technical equipment you possess based upon modern science however like everything else in this world people based upon age, based upon level of sickness and other circumstances, some sometimes are seeming to be heading in a direction where it doesn't seem a medical option of cure is there. And the body starts to slowly but surely develop all different types of illnesses and sicknesses and body systems start to weaken and some start to shut down. And you're coming to the point in which the medical community are looking upon this patient and saying what type of quality of life does this person have? And they start throwing into the minds of the caretakers, the family, and say, why are you muttering? Why are you driving this person crazy? Why are you making him go through all these different types of medical, medical treatments? Why are you putting him on this machinery? It's not, it's not concept of Avis Israel. It's the not showing love and compassion. And they give the family a guilt conscience. And as a result of this, many people fall for it and therefore decide to just throw in the towel and let the medical community make their decisions and do what they have to do and put the person out of misery according to what they feel is the time to put him out of misery based upon a secular medical perspective of a lack of quality of life. What I have found over the years dealing with these topics in Shalos is that many times the decision to do this is not based upon the Rahmanis the hospital has for the patient 
but based upon the monetary concern that they've used up the insurance money and therefore it's no longer a value for them to keep the patient in the hospital, it's a waste of their time and money based upon the fact they're not being paid for the, for the machinery nor for the people who are servicing them. And therefore there's an agenda, what's called the business of medicine. And it's in cases like this that I and others have to intervene to try to find out the facts, to actually ask the doctors and the nurses and to do research what actually is the situation concerning this patient to find out whether that they're that terminally ill that they're holding towards the end of their life and that within the last couple of weeks of existence based upon the body deteriorating, is that, is that the reality? Or do they have a number of months to live? But once again, the hospital has its monetary agenda and therefore they don't see this person ever succeeding medically, statistically. So let's therefore put them out of their misery prematurely and make the patient uh, as comfortable as possible. So you can say there's a merciful phenomenon as well, but there's a monetary phenomenon. So la halacha, what are you allowed to do when a person comes that deathly ill at the end of life? Whether you're suffering from end-stage cancer, you're suffering from end-stage heart ailments, whatever the illness might be, and you're coming towards the end. So what's interesting is there is a specific halacha in Shulchan Aruch Shimon Lamites, which is perhaps the most misquoted halacha when it comes to piske halachas in, in the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, what the Shulchan Aruch says, and, uh, and it's written when it's called the Halachas of Gosis, that's where in Shin Lamates in Yeredeah, that when a person comes to the end of life, and Gosis is a person in the world of Halacha that's going to die approximately in about three days, that's what a Gosis is, a moribund patient. So once you see that patient is shutting down slowly but surely, and most people reach that medical level of incompetence in their body capacities, based upon halachic statistics and medical statistics, Rav Gos and Lamisa, most of them are going to pass away. It's a natural chanarach sif, that there's a Ramah, where the Ramah says, if that's the case, if a person is going to die anyway within the next 72 hours, the Ramah says you're allowed to take away impediments to death. Hasaras hamenei muteras. It's a Ramah in Shulchan Aruch. But the problem is, what does that Ramah mean? What is the basic halachic actual practical application of the Ramah? The Ramah gives a very strange example. An example he gives is, is the wood chopper chopping in the backdrop, causing a turmoil. And they used to believe in those days if there's turmoil of noise in the backdrop, the person can die in peace. So what you do, and this is based upon a quote from the Sefer Hasid, which the Ramah quotes, you tell the wood chopper to take a little lunch break. There's no longer any turbulence, that the person die in peace. So that's the removing of the impediment to death you're allowed to do. In the world of practical medical halacha, how does that translate in modern medicine? So I want you to know in the 1700s, there were two gro- grace, gro- very great Kedole HaPoskim of two different Shalos and Shuvas, the Shus Yaakov and the uh, Beis Yaakov Shuvas, in which they debated what the Roma meant. And what the Roma means, means all the difference in the world, how do two different halacha camps in the world of Orthodox Torah Judaism deals with the problem. And let me explain to you very quickly what they say. According to the Shita of the, of the Shus Yaakov, he said, it's quite interesting. If the actual Ramah meant that once you reach end of life, and there's nothing medically you do any, for this person anymore, so therefore, Halacha Lamasa, he should have said, you stop the Mitzvah Rapi Arapa, let nature take its course. But the Ramah doesn't say that. The Ramah says, take away the wood chopper chopping the wood. So, that's it. so on this specific Nakuda, the Shus Yaakov says, from here we see, that the only thing you're permitted to do is stop supernatural phenomena that are keeping the patient alive, because there's no medical logic with the wood chopper. But he never said you can stop the medical treatment and you must continue all the way to the end to the time the patient expires. That's the way the Shvis Yaakov Paskind, and the latter Paskind, contemporary Paskind, is his psak that was accepted by the Tzitz Eliezer of Waldenberg and other Gedala Paskind. That's why many Torah communities, they will not allow you to dis- disconnect your stuff to anything until the person expires. That's one camp of thought. The base Yaakov, who was the contemporary of the Shus Yaakov, disagrees. He says, that even though the mushal given by the Ramah is a very funny mushal, he held that the real underlying motif of this specific shita of, of the Ramah is that once the patient no longer is cured by normal medical treatment, the mitzvah rapi rapi as a refua, even when it comes to being deich Shabbos, no longer applies. And therefore, if that's the case, according to him, when you're holding at the end, you can stop medical treatment. That's the psak of the Beis Yaakov. And therefore, it's, we're talking about real medical treatment, not just a question of something supernatural. Interesting enough, two Gedoli Hadar, one in Eretz Israel, and one over here, Ramosh Zatzal in America, Ravavach Zatzal in Eretz Israel, 
took this Beis Yaakov Shita and they made a very interesting dichotomy. And this is the way they pass it. They pass it that once a patient reaches a level of medical care that the actual treatment process, like a person undergoing radioactive treatment or chemotherapy, other things like this, once you see there's no actual medical cure being accomplished by this type of treatment, and the only thing that's being accomplished is you're maintaining the person in their life by holding back the inevitable from taking place, at that point in time, the mitzvah of rapi rapi actively treating no longer becomes a halachic obligation when it comes to that part, and therefore the patient or their family can make the determination whether you want to continue or you can stop. But that's when it comes to medical treatment. When it comes to biological maintenance, giving hydration, nutrition, pain medicine, or antibiotics or other stuff to support them in their biological existence, that must be continued all the way to the end. That's the biological maintenance. And that, they claim, is not negotiable based upon what the Ramah said. It's only active medical treatment, rapi rapi, of therapeutic care. The one who no longer becomes efficacious, I can stop it if I want. And that's the way these gedor lehadar paskim. So according to Halach, you have Mahamish two camps of thought. There are some in the Torah world that accepted the Chumrah of the Tzitz Eliezer based upon the Shusyaki to continue everything to the end. And however, there are many people who follow the Pesach of Moshe Feinstein or of Arbach, and many of the Gedolim who were involved in Pisgah Halachas accepted that, I think, as a major Yisod in their Pisgah Halachas, that when you reach the end of life, end of life, that nothing is helping the patient, at that point in time you have the decision to make the option to stop the therapeutic and maintain the biological maintenance. Now why am I saying this? Because the many people outside who heard this and decided we're not just going to apply this in the last couple of days, a week of a person's life, we're going to start already promulgating this six months before that eventuality ever takes place. As soon as I hear from the hospital that there's no hope for this patient, and based upon statistics they're going to die eventually, so why much of them for the next six months? Let's start applying this halacha criteria. But the problem was the halacha criteria was never meant to be applied six months before. It was meant to apply in the halachas of Gosses, as it is codified and mentioned by the Ramon Shulchan Arich. I can tell you, I, when I lecture about this topic, I point this out. People on the spot, they never heard this chilek before. I can tell you, Rav David Bleich and his writings goes over above and behind the Kodu to try to bring people to understand. Look in the Shimon Shalom Ates, where the Ramon was mentioned, and understand the context in which it's mentioned. So therefore, what I want to point out to you is you have to be very careful as a consumer in the marketplace. When you go to a hospital and doctors and nurses, everybody are telling something, you have to know, number one, what is the medical reality? Where are they holding over here? How far do they have when it comes to ultimately eventual death taking place? And based upon that, I can then make the determination what I'm medically responsible to do. One thing is for sure, that once I come to the end days of a person's existence, and we're talking about now the last week or so, and you base, or maybe two weeks or so, and you see the person slowly but surely is getting worse and worse. So what we have today as an option in the medical world is the concept of halachic hospice. I'm sure those who are here will discuss that, but the basic idea of halachic hospice is, is to make sure that the patient itself, at the end of their life, is made as comfortable as possible, to maintain the biological vitality of this patient to the end, as long as what you're giving that patient benefits them medically and physically, Stopping to treat them and act the medical therapies are basically discontinued. And the major hakpada, Arav Moshe and Rav Arbach, on the concept of uh, medically halachic hospice, is they point out it's predicated upon the fact, as the Pasuk in the Torah, the Ahafta Larecha Kamocha, and the Gemara says, what does that mean? Baha give a person a beautiful death if you possibly can. So therefore, Whatever biologically maintains, when it comes to liquids, when it comes quite obviously to, to nutrients, when it comes to pain management, whatever can make them as comfortable as possible, and even antibiotics to try to fight off various types of bacteria that are giving them pain as well, should be done. But when it comes to actively treating them with all different types of treatments that no longer have any therapeutic benefit, Shavatas, I can stop at that specific point in time. And the fact is, that halachic hospice, Baruch Hashem, we now have established today. There are institutions out there that are doing it. Even places that were normally, in the past, were not involved in this. Cavalry, for instance, decided it sees a clientele, a Jewish clientele, so they decide to get halachic experts to now deal with halachic hospice. You can make the demand on the marketplace today, and it's available. But you have to make sure you have proper halachic hospice. What you have to, however, make sure is that when you ever have to make decisions like this, 
do not make these decisions yourself. There are people out there, myself and other Rabbanim, who have trained in this field, who know how to talk to doctors and ask information and elicit the proper facts to know how to guide you. I've had cases, even in places like uh, some Jewish hospitals in our five, five, five boroughs, where a patient was assessed by the medical staff and the family were told, stop medical treatment, the person's about to die. They wanted the family to feel it's really a hospice case. The fact, when I got involved and I started talking to the doctors and nurses, we did a little research over here, the reality, it wasn't. What was happened was the medical insurance ran out. And therefore, it's basically a financial loss for them. The family ultimately was smart. They were lawyers, so they once said in front of each other, in front of one of the doctors, they're killing our father. We're going to have a tremendous lawsuit over here against the hospital. As soon as the hospital heard that, they didn't bother them for the next six months where the patient lived and died ultimately when they were supposed to die. But what I'm pointing out to you is you have to always be suspect. Is it the patient's concern? Is it their concern? And you have to have Ehrlich doctors who know what they're doing to give you the proper information. It's all one big picture. The bottom line, which I want to share with you because I want to give time to everybody else to speak, is that you have to be an informed consumer. It's a painful process to see a loved one, a beloved member of your family passing away in front of you. And it's on a subjective level, it's one of the most difficult things to experience. I, in my own life, had to experience this with my own wife within the last past year. And it was a very difficult thing for me to deal with. I had to deal with the halachic besides the emotional. But I was able to get in the hospital that I was in. Uh, halachic hospice that I created there in order that she should have the ability to have the last minutes of her life covered. She died a, a death of tremendous manucha because I was there to intervene. If I left it up to the hospital and I would allow them to take her to their hospice, I don't know what would have happened when it comes to her end. So therefore, I'm pointing out to you is you have to be proactive, you have to ask questions, realize you're stopping treatment six months before. Nobody halakhali justifies that. You have, the patients have to be given, we'll find out later on, a disclosure, what types of care are available, palliative care or active care, I'll let other people talk about it, we have doctors over here. After the presentations of everybody, if you want to ask me more questions, I'm available, let the doctor come up and take over. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, okay, so uh, first thing I want to say, my name is Mordechai Grossman, Dr. Grossman. Um, I'm a hospice and palliative physician. I also did internal medicine for many years, had a private practice up until very recently. The first thing I have to say is often I hear that there's an option between aggressive care and palliative care. And as a physician, I want to say that that is completely a problem, and I'll tell you why. And I understand where the rabbi is coming from, and, and I'll explain. Palliative care means a focus on making the patient comfortable. Palliative care does not in any way, shape, or form preclude curative therapy. I hate to use the term aggressive therapy, because often when patients have tremendous pain and symptoms, we are very, very aggressive in managing those symptoms. Okay? But we must understand that palliative care is not exclusive of curative therapy. In fact, a landmark study done in the New England Journal of Medicine about five years ago, which shook the foundations of medicine, like, you know, Harsi and I shook the foundations of the world, that was many, many years ago. Every now and then in medicine, there's a one study that shakes the foundation. And to sum it up quickly, they took patients with metastatic lung cancer with a prognosis of less than six months, and they randomized half of them to receive curative therapy and palliative care by the oncologist, and the other half to receive um, curative therapy by an oncologist and palliative care by a palliative care physician. And the patients who received the palliative care by the palliative care physician, all else being the same, lived an average of three months longer. Why? 
because their pain was managed, their shortness of breath was managed, their nausea, there's a vomiting. When a person has a significant illness, there's a tremendous battle on the person, because of course we want to live every single moment of life that we can, but on the other hand, the level of suffering, I'm talking about from the patient's perspective, let's forget about the family for one second, there comes a point in time where the patient loses their will to live. And often I see amongst our people this unnecessary suffering. And I don't mean by that ending life before God wants it to end. What I mean by that is while the patient is getting treatment, there's no reason they should have pain and shortness of breath. There's a fear in the world, not just in Jewish community, but in the community in general, about certain medications that are used for patients with very, very severe symptoms, like morphine and dilaudid and fentanyl. I can change the way anyone, chocolate, vanilla, strawberry. The bottom line is that morphine, dilaudid, fentanyl, these are all opiate medications. And yes... If the doctor wants to, just like could have done for the past 3,000 years, we would always have the ability to provide a terminal dose of a medication to end the patient's life. And yet, amongst the Gentile world, the secular world, in the Hippocratic Oath, part of the oath is, we will do nothing to hasten the patient's death, because if you know how to save life, you know how to end it. That is not halacha. But in properly managed a doctor who has special training and expertise, these various medications, and I'm focusing on pain, there's lots of other symptoms, are life-saving. We talk about Chaim Maruchim. You have to take care of the patient's symptoms, regardless of whether or not they have one day to live or they have 10 years to live. Now, of course, you have to go to someone who's an expert, and someone you trust. Those are the two factors I think Rabbi Flam is talking about. Who do you trust? Okay? There's a whole Indian in the halakha, I'm not going to say that, regarding how do you trust a doctor, especially if the doctor happens to be not Michelanu. How do you trust them? But they also have to be an expert. If anyone in this room, God forbid, needed an appendectomy, would you go to your wonderful internal medicine doctor to take out your appendix? You might go to the doctor to clear you for the surgery, but you're, that doctor's not taking out your appendix. Let's just suspend the legal parts and the malpractice, okay? You are not going to go to a doctor to take out your gallbladder unless he's a surgeon who has expertise in taking out gallbladders. Same thing here. Palliative care is a specialty gets a bad rap. Some of it is earned. I want to say that right away. Because there are doctors in my specialty that will do exactly what the rabbi is saying. They will come to a family as an agent of the hospital to try to convince the family, oh, come on, where are we going with this? We're not going in the right direction. Maybe we should do this or that. And take away care. Take away care for various ulterior motives. That's not the palliative care I'm talking about. And if you see that, you need to find someone else to be doing the palliative care. Okay? They should be presenting you the facts without color, without Perush Rashi. If they use Perush Rashi, it wouldn't be so bad. Without Perush, what are the facts? And this is a very important point because I don't care who the doctor is. When the rabbi needs to find out how to make a decision regarding these matters, it is wrong in my professional opinion to have the family talk with the rabbi only. Absolutely not. How is the rabbi getting the facts filtered through the emotional lens of the family? There needs to be a doctor-rabbi communication. I hate to tell you, this does not happen often enough. Some of it is on the medical community. Some of it is on the rabbinical community. There needs to be this communication. So this way, the rabbi who knows the halakha can speak to the expert in the medicine. And you know what? Maybe the rabbi might tell the family... I need to speak to somebody else, another doctor, because I'm, I don't feel I'm getting the proper information from that doctor. 
and someone who knows the halachas and knows about these topics will be able to feel out right away if a physician is coloring it. I just had the unpleasant duty of being the healthcare proxy for my mother-in-law. Alea Shalom. I have to tell you, as a physician, it was one of the most difficult things I ever had to do because I saw certain things about my colleagues that were nauseating. And here I'm in the business. So, what the rabbi is saying about an advocate and getting the correct information, that is essential. And if you're not getting the correct information from Dr. X, what does the halacha say? I'm not passing halacha, but the rabbi said it. You have to find a baki to give you the right answer. And not necessarily the answer you're looking for, the answer that is the emet, without mefarshim. That's palliative care. I can't tell you once again how many people suffer getting curative therapy, suffering miserably because the family doesn't want to medicate the patient because they're afraid they're going to try to kill the patient. The rabbi doesn't want to medicate the patient because he doesn't trust the doctor they're going to kill the patient. There is no state in this country where a physician or a family member can legally provide a legal dose of medication to a patient. What has to happen in the four states, and I, have, I hate to tell you, this is going to go just like the other topic that just went through last year, which in 10 years ago was unheard of, and now suddenly is legal, it's constitutional right. I'm not going to say anything about that. This is going to be, every state is going to fall on this. That people are going to also have the constitutional right to end their life when they want to, assuming they have certain medical criteria. If that was required of me as a physician to participate with that, I'd have to find another line of work. That's the kind of doctor you need to find. Someone who is, even if he's asked to end a patient's life, is going to say, absolutely not. I'm not doing that. I'm going to give you the options. So that's palliative care in a nutshell. Be careful, because there are doctors, once again, that are in palliative care that are not necessarily doing L'Shem Shamayim. But it can be done L'Shem Shamayim, and I'm going to say to you, when a patient is undergoing treatments, it is essential to have their symptoms managed. I had a patient when I first went to a certain hospital, 28 years old with metastatic colon cancer, thin as a rail, not eating, miserable in pain. I made some adjustments to his medications, put about a diluted PCA, details not important, Got him comfortable. After two or three weeks, got him discharged from the hospital. Got him home. Six weeks later, he went to the oncologist to get chemotherapy and lived for another year afterwards. Why? If his symptoms weren't managed, he would have been dead. Because he was already at the point where he was done. It doesn't have to be that way. We have wonderful, wonderful medications and wonderful, wonderful ways to deliver these medications to make sure that the patients are comfortable. Assuming we can get through all the roadblocks. So what is hospice? Hospice is when, obviously for an Orthodox or for a family, after they've spoken with their Rav, and the Rav says it is permitted in that situation to enter into hospice. Hospice is where the only treatment left, the only curative treatment left, there is none. But the focus is on symptom management, making sure patients are free of symptoms. And I have to tell you, sometimes, and that's why there needs to be a discussion between the doctor and the rabbi, this is on my experience and what I see every day, sometimes the things that we think we are doing that are helping the patient are actually hurting the patient. So we have to be very, very clear, because we never want to do anything that's going to make a patient's life end sooner, aside from the idea of going to Gehenna after 120 years, which I didn't become a doctor to do that, okay? But there are certain things that there needs to be connection between rabbi and doctor to discuss each type of treatment. There are certain situations where antibiotics are killing a patient. 
C. diff colitis. Continue giving antibiotics. They still have C. diff. The diarrhea doesn't go away. They get toxic megacolon and die. Antibiotics are not benign therapy. If they were benign therapy, you'd be able to go to the pharmacy and get it yourself without a prescription. So there is even IV fluids, normal saline, requires a physician's prescription throughout the country because this is a medicine. Again, we need honest discussions by an expert, just like in any other area of medicine, to make sure you're dealing with an expert in that field. And often in these patients that are sick, there are multiple specialists, okay? Sometimes the hardest part is trying to figure out who do we believe, who's really giving the right shake, who's really telling us what's going on. So that's palliative care in hospice. And I just want to illustrate one other point, specifically about morphine. Everybody has morphine, like, oh my gosh, morphine, oh my god, oh my gosh. They did a study, obviously not with religious Jews, where they took patients who, for whatever reason, the families made a determination they wanted to extubate them because the patient wasn't living, because they wouldn't have wanted to live like this, whatever the, whatever it's, whatever the mice is, the reason why they were making determination to take the patients off the ventilator, okay, and letting them die. And they wanted to see which ones live longer. And the study showed that the ones that were on the higher doses of morphine lived longer. For patients who had neurological problems, an average of 2 milligrams an hour. For patients with heart problems, an average of 7.5 milligrams an hour. Personally, while I do use those doses, those are not more, the more common doses of morphine use making patients comfortable is 0.5 an hour, 1 milligram an hour. So it has a bad rap. And how do you understand this? How do you, because morphine suppresses respiration. Yes, if, you, if it's given in a dose that's going to kill a patient, yes, it suppresses respiration. Just like if you go to the cardiologist, instead of him giving you 60 milligrams of, digi- 60 milligrams of diltiazem, he gives you 3,000 milligrams of diltiazem, the person's going to die. You have to go to an expert. That's what the halakha requires. That's the right thing to do. Find someone who's going to give you what you need to hear and make sure that practitioner is willing to speak directly with the Rav. And if the Rav is not willing to speak to the doctor for whatever reason, my advice is you have to find another Rav. Because this communication cannot happen with the filter of the family. Okay. How is a doctor, you're a doctor, how do yes. you deal with those doctors who you felt were off the wall? I'll tell you the story. You ready for this? It's very important because we're not the actors and we have to deal with I don't know how after this experience I had, to be honest, for the first time I'm saying this publicly, I don't know how anybody can be a healthcare proxy and not be a doctor. I don't know. I don't I I mean my whole family, I'm the only doctor. She was my mother in law, but she picked me to be the proxy. Two sons three sons and a daughter who was my wife, okay? But she picks me to be the proxy. <laughs> and she changed it eight months ago it's like she knew what was going to go on so I'm getting a call from some doctor in a wonderful hospital not in Manhattan in Long Island but a wonderful hospital basically on a Thursday Thursday saying to me we want to talk about you know mom is your mother-in-law is not doing so well we just want to have a conversation of the next step so in my very very experienced mind that's the palliative care discussion waiting to happen so what did I do because I know a little bit about the business. I didn't call her back on Thursday. I waited until Friday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's when I called her back, because I know that's going to buy a weekend. Okay? I had already spoken to other members of the team about what I'm going to say now. So she calls me up and starts giving me the spiel. Well, you know, mom's not doing so well. She's on the ventilator. She's really not responding. Why not just take her off the machine, make her comfortable, let her die? Okay? I said, to be honest with you, I think there might be another option there. I went through the medicine, said, well, she was intubated for this reason. I don't really see any reason medically why she's not coming off the machine. I hear you, it's been difficult, and maybe a little more time is needed. But I'm telling you, as a family, this is what we're going to do. We would like, when you feel she's as maximized as possible, because there's a downside to keeping a patient on a ventilator too long, uh, a lot longer than the hospital wants you to believe, but too long. We have to understand what that means, but that's a separate... 
So we'd like to come there as a family, and then we will, you'll remove the machine. We want to encourage her to try to breathe, and if she can't breathe on her own, we're going to put her back on the machine, and you can trach her the following day. So the doctor says to me, well, she's not comfortable with that. I mean, what do you mean not comfortable with that? Not comfortable with that. She's in the ICU, for God's sake. She's not in the, you know, in the, at home. I'm not comfortable with that. Why are you not comfortable with that? Well, I'm not going to do that because I'm not comfortable. But I spoke to two members of the team, the lung specialist and another surgeon on the case. I spoke to them, and they said this would be a reasonable option. This is what I trained with 15 years ago. I'm not comfortable with that. I said, okay, doc, let me tell you how it's going to go. I'm going to come there on Monday with the family, and I'm going to demand you remove her from the machine, but you're not going to give her any sedation. You're going to take her off the machine, and we're going to see there, we're going to be there the entire time. And what I'm going to do is, as soon as you get her off the machine, I'm going to rescind what I said and tell you I want you to put her back on the machine when she needs to go on the machine. So anywhere you go, you're going to do it my way. So what do you give me a hard time for? And then afterwards she said, after we talked a little bit more, um, that's not a bad idea. Ugh, what do I do about that? I... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what to do about that. I, I don't know what to do about that if I was a lay person, to be honest with you. I don't know what I would do with that. And I, I, after this, this experience, I have a hard time understanding how even a rabbi who is knowledgeable about medical issues is getting the right story from some people. Yes? You're asking for several layers here. And it's not everybody that goes to Dr. Mordecai Grossman so that we can avoid somebody's going to abuse the system. There's a lot at stake. There may be a great deal of money at stake, both that's going to be spent and that's going to be squandered. We're talking about loved ones and the emotional component of what the facility wants to do and how much money is going to be spent on this person. With so much need for reliance in an emotional storm, how can appropriate choices for a professional be made? Because we can't necessarily only have the son-in-law, despite the fact that there are three sons and a daughter. We can't necessarily have Rabbi Flau on speed dial. That's not necessarily feasible for every single client. And as we look out at the professionals who are available, they're going to say, I'm a palliative care doctor. I'm not a oncologist who's providing palliative care. How do we guide a person, speaking as a professional, I'm going to tell you. How do we function as consumers to be able to okay. pick somebody we can trust? They, she, people, when I ha I'm a palliative care physician, I also work in a hospital. So not every patient I'm taking care of is a hospice patient. I have these family meetings. My family meeting goes nothing like the one that I had with this doctor. My family go meeting goes like this. The first thing I will say is, the first, I explain what my role is because nobody has a clue what my role is simply because we're a new specialty. It's only since 2006 there's a board certification. So the first thing I do is I say, I am here to make sure that the patient is comfortable, whether they're in the ICU or the CCU or telemetry or wherever they happen to be, to make sure that the symptoms are being properly managed, regardless of whether or not the goals of care are curative therapy. Okay? And then I will tell the family, the patient looks uncomfortable, I think we need to adjust the medication. The patient looks like they need this and I would give them my opinion just like any doctor would give their opinion when they meet with family. And then the next thing I do is I say something like this. The only individuals that should be providing the goals of care for the patient are the patient or their family. The physicians are not responsible for the goals of care. We are responsible for the plan of care. And what I do is I try to make sure, when I'm speaking to the family, that the goals of care of the patient or their family, because often these patients are not able to say what their goals of care are, the plan of care should be in line with the goals of care. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes the doctors are recommending more and more and more different things that's really not helping the patient. They're erecting surgery when the patient's going to die anyway and likely die in the surgery. So it goes both ways. I got a call once. The family patient, the, um, the, the, um, 
This is a patient with metastatic prostate cancer in the ICU, came after a fall, and basically the, the doctors wanted to not put a pacemaker in the patient. So they called me to try to convince the family not to put a pacemaker in. But the problem is the patient was able to walk, able to go shopping for themselves, completely independent. I said, absolutely, you're going to put a pacemaker in this patient, and then if he qualifies for hospitals, put him on hospice after he comes out of the hospital. But you put a pacemaker in this patient. Another situation where they were entertaining dialysis on a patient that the vascular surgeon called me because there was no place to put the catheter because the patient was completely contracted, their knees were bent up so they have no veins, oh, things over here, and not to mention the life expectancy of the patients was such that based on the nephrology guidelines themselves, dialysis is not going to help this patient. So it goes both ways. So the answer to you is first... The palliative care should be responsible for the comfort of the patient. If that is not the first thing they're talking about, then I have a problem. What are they doing? Then they're an agent for the hospital. Okay? The next thing is when they're presenting you the options, like Rabbi Lefkowitz always mentions, all of the options need to be provided. The curative options and the hospice options. And sometimes the problem is the family's goals of care are unrealistic from a medical standpoint. No matter how much I try, I can't jump 25 feet in the air. So there are certain situations where the doctors have to try to talk the family that their goals of care are unrealistic. Given the med and that's an issue of trust. Okay? So and the other question is a very simple one. When the doctor's talking to you, do you trust them within five or ten minutes? It shouldn't take more than that. If the practitioner cannot, if they're not making eye contact, if they're not looking and in concern and showing that caringness inside, this is not a discussion where the doctor's on the phone like this checking his text messages and talking to you. You should be able to tell quickly. Again, sometimes it's, you can be fooled. Follow your gut. If your gut is telling you that this person is not trustworthy, probably they're not trustworthy. And then what do you do? You find another doctor. When the person is in that critical state, and I don't know. As the rabbis, what are you supposed to do if you don't trust the doctor taking care of the patient? I mean, there's an old Jewish joke. You know, once you go for a doctor, it gives you one opinion, you get a second opinion, right? Okay, so speak to the Rav. And Chaim Aruchim is a wonderful organization to call, in my understanding, after speaking to Rabbi Lefkowitz, that they have physicians in each hospital. Because when the Rav is trying to give the Psach Halacha, sometimes they need to have a physician who's going to give the information that the Rav needs without color. So, my, and if there isn't, then it's up to the job of the Chaim Aruchim and other organizations to identify physicians in every hospital where patients happen to be who can, ad, who can be properly asked regarding... And there's nothing wrong with a second opinion. A physician who's not willing to have a second opinion, that's a Balgava. Because there's a halacha, forgive me for quoting halacha, that says if you go to a doctor and he gives you a certain treatment and the treatment doesn't work, and you go to another doctor, and the doctor recommends exactly the same treatment. What's the halacha? What's the halacha? You take the treatment. Why? Because it's shlichut. Maybe the first doctor wasn't a shaliach, and this one is. Yes. That's a value judgment. Why it is I'm gonna tell you because very simple. Doctor, are you willing to fill out a death certificate on this patient? Yes or no? If the answer is no, then the patient is still alive. They may seem dead, okay? But that's what I mean, a value judgment. But why would you want to see someone you love just lying That is a separate question. That is a separate question. Okay? That's a halakha question. Yes? You know, I had a discussion. I had a friend, a couple, 
where the husband had been so, so, so close to death in a few different situations, and we were having, and then he got better, we were having a discussion at a Shabbos lunch table, and I, I said, you know, if it was me, maybe I would just want to go, and he, the guy who had been very sick, he said, no, there's such a thing as a will to live. It's huge. And he had been very close. I wondered, do you mind if I ask, do we have the phone number for Chaim Aruchim? 718-301-9800. There's a 24-hour hotline. And the rabbis were trained by doctors for a year and a half. They went through a, a very intensive medical school education. Just like the rabbi here, the rabbi, Rabbi Flam, he, he, he learned many years in yeshiva, but he, he, is, he has a tremendous knowledge of medicine, and the people who answer the 24-hour hotline have a tremendous knowledge, and, uh, and, like, and like the doctor and the rabbi said, you're entitled to get both options from the doctor, and you're entitled to tell the doctor that you're not interested what he would do with his mother. Right. What he would do with his mother, that should not be coming up but unless it, you it's ask. Professional in the field of social work, psychiatry, psychology, if a social worker tells you, you know, uh, if it was my mother, this is what I would do, that person would lose their license. And the medical, the doctors seem to take the license of saying, this, this is what I would do if it was my mother, and it's completely wrong. It's, it's not the right way. I just want to make. Interested. I just want to make one comment. Seven one eight three zero one nine. Forgive me. One more comment about the wood chopper that the rabbi brought up here. Let me give you the modern version of the wood chopper. Here's the modern version of, the, and this happens frequently. Patients can hear up until the very end. That's what the Shulchan Ruch is saying by the fact that he's able to hear the wood chopping outside. So we need to understand that what you wouldn't say to a patient or in front of a patient when they are conscious, you should not be saying to them when they are unconscious. And the worst thing in the world, and I have seen two people die fa a lot faster than I thought they were going to die, not because I gave them too much medication, because there was a family altercation in their presence. Never, never, never do that. That is worse than the wood chopping. If there's family dynamics going on and you need to get into a little bit of a whatever, take it outside. Never, never in front of the patient because that will take oh, the worst thing in the world for someone is to watch that their illness is causing the people they love to be fighting. Never do that in front of a patient and everything in front of the patient. If the doctor, I'll give you another tip. You're in the room with the patient in the hospital and the doctor and the team walks in. Guess what you should do as the family? Walk out, but stand at the door. Don't have the conversation with the doctor about the patient in front of the patient. Especially if they're, if they're, unco if they're conscious, then there's a question you have to. If they're not conscious, there's no reason they need to know that information. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Excellent.